On this episode of The Business of Tech, a conversation with John Ayers from Newspire. They've got a new threat modeling tool out, so let's talk about what threat modeling is, why you care, what happens if you don't do it, how it fits into zero trust, and what he thinks the industry needs to do to fight back and win the cybersecurity war. This is The Business of Tech. I want to start by talking about threat modeling. You guys got my attention at Newspire because you've made some advances on threat modeling, but let's take a quick moment and step back. Talk to me about threat modeling and what it is. Yeah, I think there's two there's two things around threat modeling. There's a, a software defined threat modeling, which you know Microsoft and uh, OWASP and those uh, those guys have created, which is really around you know building out your software. But then there's the threat modeling around uh, industry risk and understanding the techniques and, and or controls you have in place to combat those techniques. Um, in today's world, threat modeling, uh, you know, prior to our launch in January, was really uh, professional services driven. It was consulting driven. It would take you four, six, four weeks to six weeks to potentially eight weeks, anywhere between fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars. Uh, for someone to come in and create that that threat model for your organization in your for your industries or industry that you're actually uh, doing. So um, today, the, the the approach or around that is cumbersome for and and, and to be honest with you, Dave, uh, expensive for some of the small, medium enterprise type clients who just can't afford to do it, but necessarily need it. So um, it's a it's an interesting evolution that, that we've gone to and where we need to continuously to go personally. So why do you threat model? Like what's the why behind doing it? The, the why behind it, it really helps organizations kind of really understand where they're most obsessed, uh, you know, susceptible to, right? Meaning who's really coming at you um, and where and what type of attack is being used against you. Um, and, and what controls or data sources may, might be most valuable to the uh, to the hacker to the bad guy, right? Um, the the other piece that's important to note here it, it really helps customers really you know guide them to where they really need to focus. Too often, what we have found, Dave, is people focus on getting compliant, and then a lot of people right now say, "Hey, I'm compliant, I'm secure," and that's not really. Um, really the right approach, right? While it helps lay the groundwork to getting secure, threat modeling now, if you overlay that a little bit, it also helps them build an effective security program on top of that, meaning enhancing what they may already be establishing as part of their compliance. One, by showing the clients the threats that may be facing them. A lot of you know customers today or clients really don't understand what threats are facing them in their industry. And then ultimately, how do I prioritize that? How do I then log for that? How do I detect that? And then ultimately, how do I mitigate that? Okay. And I think it's implied, but I but I never want to assume, so which is why I ask questions like this. So what's the gap if somebody doesn't do the threat model? <laughs> yeah, the, I'll tell you what the big gap here is, is the unknown, right? Is you just don't know how uh, to combat that, right? You don't know what battleships may be forming in the horizon uh, of attacking you in that industry. So let's take an example, healthcare. Healthcare has various attack techniques that are being used against them all the time. However, you may be in healthcare, but also in retail, right? Because you're collecting credit cards and things. There's, while some of the attack techniques are similar, the outcomes uh, of how you protect yourself are obviously different. So um, you can't assume that, you know, if I do this, I'm going to solve for that. If I, it's, it's a lot like you're protecting your home, right? Um, you, you've gone and put on door, uh, you know, deadbolts and things of that nature. You put on motion lights, but is that enough uh, to protect you in an area that you may not know what is being used to, to the bad guys maybe breaking into homes? Um, maybe are they able to circumvent that, things of that nature. So the whole idea here is really helping them educate them, giving them the tool uh, around that specific intelligence, tailored to that specific client, mapped to their specific controls. And you know what? The key here is mapping it or making it, presenting it, that it's actionable for them to do something with it. The biggest problem we have today in security is there's so much it's so complex, and at the end of the day, 
people really are still grasping, what do I do with it? What do I, what can I leverage about it that makes it actionable for me to do something to could do this? And I like your analogy, right? When we think about security, we think about it from a physical perspective, because I like talking about that. How do you, as a security expert, measure too much? And if I use your example, right? I have windows, I have doors. Well, I can put a second deadbolt on, but by the way, I could put a third, I could put a fourth, right? I could I could start putting cameras on, I could put really locks, I could double lock, I could put, you know, like I could put an electrified fence. I could, there, there is a perception that this is a money pit of I can keep throwing things at it. How do you measure where that balance is? That, you know, that is a great question. And I, I'm going to have to defer back to my law enforcement experience. Um, it, it goes back to assumable risk. How much are you willing to assume? Because look, let's be honest, there's no silver bullet in cybersecurity, physical security, anything we do, right? There's always going to be a way for someone to circumvent the control, right? Um, so you have to assume some risk. The question that everybody has to ask themselves is how much risk am I willing to assume? Um, but there's the, also the lack of education that says I have nothing no one wants. And that is the problem that we all need to look ourselves in the mirror is there's always something someone wants. And now you have to put that enough, what is enough is really what you're getting at. You'll never be able to get enough because there are always someone, someone or some group that's trying to figure out how to circumvent that. But if you have visibility, if you have the ability to monitor, then guess what? You combat that. The biggest problem a lot of people really don't understand is the harder you make it, the less interested the bad guy is. And um, like an example, at your home, you put us, you've got ADT, you put the sticker up there, you got Simply uh, Safe, you got a sticker up. That may be just enough to deter somebody not to do what? Break into your home. Whether you've got triple deadlocks, you've got motion lights, you've got a siren that kicks off because they hit a tripwire, you know, whatever the case may be. It, but can you can you visibly see and can you give them enough information that says, you know what, I, this is too hard of a target. I'm going to go after something easy because that at the end of the day is really what's taking place today is you're making yourself easy for someone to get after because you're not doing anything or you're doing what you think is just enough. And this is where our threat modeling tool comes in is giving you that actual intelligence of what things you should be doing so that you can actually do what? Do something about it uh, because you just don't the problem we have today is we don't know what we don't know and i know that sounds kind of odd but a lot of our our uh, our customers in the space today small internet medium enterprise space do not know what is being used to attack them and that's magic right now you know what what they're using to attack you now you can put some type of defense in place to prevent it um, but it doesn't doesn't solve for everything particularly because you've got experience in law enforcement. I want, I want you to help me understand where the, the analogy breaks down a little bit, though, when we compare the physical world to the virtual one. And what I mean by this is in a physical world, right, the challenges to doing that breach are significant because there's physical bit, right? Like I have a person that's a limited resource who has to attempt to break in on a door or a window or, or whatever that is. So there's that. There's also the penalty, which is, you know, I can I can go to I definitely know there's a link up to jail and all of the the bits where you know law enforcement will physically show up and haul somebody off who's caught in my house. But now when I go to the virtual world, they can completely automate the attack, right? The autom like I, I can script all that. That's all automated. I have infinite capacity. I can knock on every single door. Uh, the likelihood of actually getting caught probably low. Will I actually get hauled into court? Will actually anybody find me? So what's your reaction to like the disconnect, particularly from the perspective of a law enforcement officer, to that difference? Well, I think there's one thing that's missing from your, your analogy there is the recon. Um, look, no one is going to break into any place, rob a store, or even hack into a place without doing some type of recon. And that is the piece that translates from physical to virtual. Guys are still, bad guys are still using the same type of techniques of doing reconnaissance. And that reconnaissance is many things. So what I mean by that is reconnaissance is they're looking at social media. They're looking at information that's out there about you and your company. What's the latest information that's been posted by news articles and things of nature. 
similar stuff that you do in the physical world is, is now transforming itself into the virtual world because why? We are a society of social. We are a society of sharing everything that we can, which provides the bad guys more information, more information about reconnaissance of you. And now they leverage some type of tools to test you, like fishing, like whaling. One of the big things a lot of people don't realize, and I recently did a, a thing about the, the logistics around COVID-19, is this whaling concept. This is, a, this is being used as reconnaissance. They're not really trying to figure out how to get into your environment. What they're trying to figure out is who's susceptible so that I can now target those people or target that area to then make access. That is where we need to think about where the transition does happen is this concept of reconnaissance and gathering intel and then figuring out what type of tool will, that can I use now. Hence why we've seen fishing go up in the hundreds of percentiles over the last few months because we're all, we're, we're so great example of this, most people are now more reluctant to touching, uh, clicking on a link in an email. They're more susceptible to clicking on a document now because they've been taught time and time again not to click on a link, but now people are putting documents. They're putting pictures. Uh, recently, Russia just came out with a technique where they're putting pictures where they've embedded code inside uh, the, the, uh, the picture. And you click on the picture to see the picture and it immediately launches an executable file. I guess my point here is that Let's not be naive. The fact is, is that no matter what it is, type of crime, there is some type of reconnaissance that's going to take place in order to do what? Figure out how to get in and how to figure out how to get out without getting caught. Got it. So that makes perfect sense to me. Now, what I want to link this then to, this idea of threat modeling and, and, and what we're looking for, to a bigger concept that I've been looking and advocating that solution providers, particularly focused on the SMB, start really focusing on, which is the idea of zero trust security. Moving to a model where we're really concentrating on, on not trusting and securing the crown jewels. How does this kind of thinking on threat modeling fit in with the idea of moving towards zero trust? Well, let's first take a step back and understand the models. There's trust, and then there's trust by verify, and then zero trust, right? Today, I think we're still in the very last two models of trusting information, but no verification, then trust by verify. It, the, the zero trust concept is still very foreign to a lot of people, but your question was, how does this get us closer, or threat modeling get us closer to zero trust? I, I, I would say that what it does is dynamically changes the way clients operate going forward because now you have tailored intelligence. Now you have tailored uh, techniques so that you can put in tools like privilege access management, identity access management, because now you understand more about what is being used to attack your industry, which then allows you to do what? Put in the right specific controls, potentially maybe as a zero trust model, right? Is uh, It helps you answer those critical questions. Who's trying to attack me? Why are they? How will they? And am I prepared? So there's where I think the linkage goes to zero trust is, is, is zero trust the right model for me to be prepared for? Uh, because now I know who's trying, why are they trying, and how will they try? Because that's well, our ultimate goal is to combat that, but we can't combat what we don't know, correct? I will, I will totally buy that line of reasoning, so I, I, I'm on board. So I'm going to throw out a premise, and I want your reaction to it. Uh, I think we're losing the cybersecurity war in business. We're just we're just falling behind and we are ultimately losing right now and there isn't a lot of evidence to me that we're winning. Uh, the or, the actors on the other side are highly sophisticated. They've they're running a you know an incredibly complicated business. They've started affiliating, they've got franchises, like they are they're doing PR and press releases, they're doing financial statements like they're just killing it over there. It's a great business, except for being illegal. I think we're losing. What's your reaction to that? No, we've been losing for a long time. <laughs> um, I, I think the, the, the one thing that you missed on that is all of it was right, except for collaboration. They collaborate better than we do, hence why we're losing. We don't, we're still very much uh, an industry, while it's a small industry, is afraid to collaborate. It, we're afraid to share because people will then take advantage of that and then you know raise their hand and say, hey, I did this. Um, you know, what I think was which was a good turning point here was the MITRE attack matrix, right? 
the MITRE ATT&CK matrix was something that was shared um, that gives a, you know creates a, a combination, a powerful combination of not only you know people like ourselves who have our own threat intelligence and intellectual property, but to to bundle that MITRE ATT&CK matrix and you know partner with likes of Recorded Future and things of that nature. There, that helps collaboration, right? But again, still the biggest problem we have in our industry today and still is, and I, I remember being at a McAfee conference with Condoleezza Rice talking in 2016, um, and her experience and all of this was just that. We don't know how to collaborate. And until we learn how to collaborate at the highest levels to the lowest levels, we're going to consistently continue to lose. So what needs to change then? Is it just we need to collaborate more or is there more to what has to change for us to start winning? Um, I think it's just how we change, right? Things like we're doing right now, like creating the threat modeling tool, things that we've got coming in the future around helping people build out their programs. Uh, you'll help, you know, the, the biggest thing we need to, uh, to do here is let's take the complexity out of it. And one of the goals, our mission as Newspire is to revolutionize that. So when you're going to start to see TMT, which has came out recently, and things that are coming down the pipe over the next few months, we, we feel we have a great grasp on you know, CISOs who are building products for CISOs, and we know how complex it is, how hard it is. And we're trying to make it simpler for you to digest it, use it, and act on it. Because at the end of the day, Dave, when you go to somebody and ask them, tell me about what, give me a definition of cybersecurity, you'll get the 10-person the game get 10 different answers and, and that that's that's a problem so that makes again makes sense to me but is this is this forced change via regulation or will industry change on its own how do you see that going to I, I think industry will change on their own uh, look industry has to continue to evolve we have to be agile we have to understand who our buyers are our users um, and we we have to stop throwing point solutions um, out there and saying this is this solves it. it. It's more than just point solutions. It's thought leadership. It's education, uh, and it really is that right. I mean, look, we're all making trying to make money, right? But uh, our goal is to dynamically what change the client's threat landscape or perception of the la threat landscape. If we educate them, guess what? That that we've won. We've won a game. We've won. That's one. We're one and zero when we educate. We're 2-0 and o if we provide thought leadership about what's forward thinking. We get the 3-0 and o if we can get them to take these specific tools and put these tools and controls in place that present some actionable uh, format for them because if not, we're going to be 0-3. And then the bad guy is going to be 4-0. Four, four and, and they're going to continue to, to rape rewards from us. And it's, it's unfortunately, you know, the old saying is China looks at us for infrastructure Russia looks at us as a piggy bank, and nation states look at us as a way to uh, how, how do we better, you know, you know, start wars. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, John, I, I think you've laid out a four-point plan of action. So I'm good. I think that's a great place to end this. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Davis. Has been great. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of the Business of Tech. If you like it, hit the like button and hit that red subscribe button. It really does make a difference, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I'm doing. You want to discuss more? Want to find out more about the interview? Go ahead and put something in the comments. I read them all, and I look forward to the ongoing discussion. If you want to get content like this every single day, the five-minute Business of Tech podcast is available wherever fine podcasts are found. Go to businessof.tech, click the blue subscribe button. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Additionally, if you want to help me with the content that I create, you can support me directly. Go to patreon.com slash MSP radio and click the button there. You choose what the content is worth and get access to these interviews and discussion episodes early. They come out for my Patreons and Patreons drive the discussion and ask questions directly. Looking forward to ongoing conversations and thanks for watching.